Hi everybody, welcome back to the studio. Um, this episode we're back on the landscape painting, the decrook. Um, we're going to start to do a second class class. We're going to start to do a second pass clean today on that. There's another layer of dirt and grime on there that I want to remove. And then I'll be having a look at the frame as well. We cleaned it last week and then this week we'll be looking at replacing some of those missing pieces, uh, casting a few bits of the uh, frame that has been damaged or has been broken. Um, so yeah, plenty to do. So uh, let's get started. Last time I'd cleaned the full painting and done a first pass. This removed lots of nicotine staining off the painting, but I could still see there was a layer of dirt and grime underneath. Um, so I've used a slightly stronger solution there, and you can see it has removed some, but not as much as I'd like. So again, this next solution, slightly stronger again, um, but you'll be able to see with this one that it is going to remove that final layer of dirt and grime. So I'm just working that area, and you'll see how much cleaner this painting is going to get. I've started the clean now on that horizon section of the sky and you can see the difference already. That blue sky is really showing through. The clouds are a lot whiter. Um, the solution now is, is just taking that final layer of dirt and grime off and revealing those true colours. So I'm just going to let this run now and you'll see me clean the rest of this painting for its second pass. As I approach this top section, you can see the stretcher bar mark coming through the painting. So I've just lightened my approach there, so I'm not pressing down hard at all. But what I'm going to do is put a piece of card or mount board underneath here, just to kind of stop the canvas resting on those stretcher bars as I uh, continue cleaning. So just getting a piece of mount board now and just gently slide that in between the canvas and the stretcher bar. And then as I continue the clean, I can apply a little bit more pressure knowing that I'm not going to make that stretcher bar mark any worse than it already is. So then as I can clean on that crease mark there, I've got full confidence that I'm not making that any worse. I'm able to put a little bit more pressure on and remove the dirt and grime on that top section. I did have a Google around to see if I could find anything else out about D. Crook. Um, nothing much came up. There are a couple of other landscapes that are available for sale online that I have seen, but not an awful lot of information about him. Um, I think he was quite a proficient artist, the way he's tackled the background and the way he's got those sheep in the distance and the colours he's used. Um, he's quite literal with his trees. I feel like he's just, if this was painted from life, he's painted every single branch that he saw or has just built those trees up with so much detail uh, and then added the small elements of the leaves and stuff. So I think he was quite a literal painter. Uh, he wasn't um, impressionistic at all by any stretch. He was just kind of representing every branch and every twig. 
Um, but yeah, it's quite nice really to put that amount of effort in and that amount of work. And so this could be a quite a contrived scene. It could be just something that he's made up or this could be a real area somewhere. I'm not entirely sure. Um, I do think some of those branches and those uh, elements of those trees do look quite generic, like he just got carried away with himself um, to build those up. These large paintings do take time to clean. This is speeded up 400%. Um, it just takes so much, um, it is just time consuming really. There's no other way to describe it. You, you're constantly looking at the painting, you're monitoring what's coming off. Your brain's fully engaged in what you're doing. So the time passes quite quickly. It is repetitive on your hand. So it does kind of, it can hurt your shoulder a while if you keep doing the same motion. So sometimes I'll reverse the motion just to kind of break things up a little bit. Um, but yeah, there's no other way around it. You're just going to put the hours in and um, concentrate. Now that the painting is fully cleaned and you can see those colours shining through, it's time to have the top coat of varnish. Um, this is a hydrocarbon fully reversible varnish designed not to uh, discolour over time. Um, but as I brush this on you'll be able to see the colours start to really shine through now. Once I'm happy that I've covered the whole canvas with varnish, I'll then work across with quick successions of brush strokes now to start working that varnish and making sure every section has been covered. Once this varnish has dried, I'll just um, have a look over the whole painting just to make sure I'm happy with everything. There is one little area that needs retouching. You can just see that in the blue section on the right hand side. Um, so I'll be retouching this and then applying another top coat of varnish on top just to seal the painting completely. Right, okay, so I'm going to let that varnish dry now. Uh, while that's drying, I'm going to get the frame out and see what we need to do. There's a couple of, uh, well, there's a few areas that have got missing sections, so I'll look at making a mould of that, so I'll show you how I do that. And then there's some areas that just kind of need filling and then uh, retouching and recolouring to match. So um, we'll make a start on that, okay? So I've got quite a few loose sections and loose pieces of this frame. So I'm just going to make a mould of this rail section here. So I've got three separate pieces. I'm just using a little bit of blue tack on the bench just to um, hold them together and hold the shape. So I'm just using that just to get myself a complete run of the pattern um, and joining those together. 
they will just be secure on the bench now and I use a silicone silicone putty um, to actually make the mould. So it comes in two parts, um, this blue part and the white part. And when you mix these together, you've got about 20 seconds or so before it actually starts to go off. So I'm just going to mix those together to get a nice pale blue finish. And then you can see this is quite nice and soft and malleable now. So I'm just going to get the rough size of the section that I want to make the mould of. Um, a little bit had gone off hard, so I'll get that out of there. And then I will just press this gently on top of the piece that I'm moulding, roughly the same size. And I'm just going to gently push that down, and then this will take the um, impression of that section that I want to cast. This takes about, I don't know, 15 minutes for it to go off. So I will let that just um, do its thing. And here's my mould. So this is the silicon putty mould. It's gone off now. It's quite flexible. I can use this to make a number of different sections now and replace those missing areas. So here's some pieces I've used making um, using compo, which is a chalk mixture and hide glue. Um, so these have been um, pressed into the mould. Some have got better definition than others. Some I'll use, some I'll discard. Um, sometimes I use plaster, sometimes I use uh, clay and use these as a push mould. Um, but some of these were quite good. Um, so I'm just going to show you how I get these to fit now. So offering it up to the frame, checking the height and then using sandpaper. Um, using the chisel here just to get a nice clean edge to get that piece to line up nicely. Um, and then it'll be a matter of offering the piece up and sanding it down and just getting it the right level and the right shape to attach to the frame. As you can see, it takes a number of attempts to um, get it to sit right in a manner that you're happy with. So usually a bit of back and forth on the sandpaper or just trimming some little bits off. So here I'm just going to try and match that mitre joint there. It doesn't go all the way to the end, but I'll use a little bit of clay filler just to kind of tidy that up. Um, so here you can see how it looks now. Um, so quite happy with the positioning and how it matches up and now I'll just use some adhesive to uh, fasten that on. And here's another smaller bit uh, further down the frame again. Sanding it down, cutting it to fit, making sure it's the right height, making sure that it just um, lines up nicely and doesn't look out of place. So I usually take a bit of time just to get this right and make sure I've got it nice and level. And then just a little bit of glue on there just to um, attach it back to the frame. And once that's dried and then in position, I'll look at recolouring that and um, building up some base coats to match the existing patina. And here again, just to add in some glue to, um, to the compo pieces and gluing them back to the frame. So as well as making new elements for the frame, I'm also reattaching old broken elements as well. Sometimes they're loose, I might take them off completely if they're a little bit loose and then reattach them. This bit's quite nice, you can actually see the original compo underneath that pattern, that brown area. And then they've used this corner embellishment over the top 
to uh, hide that mitre joint. So I'm just gluing that back into position. And then I'll recreate that other side with, um, with a clay or a putty um, just to kind of replace that missing section. So again, attaching loose pieces down here at the bottom rail. And then you can see this is bit here is where I've actually filled in with some, uh, some clay um, and just kind of replacing those missing sections that don't actually justify making a mold. Sometimes it's quicker to actually just make them out of the clay and uh, carve them to match rather than casting and making a mold. So don't forget I am a commercial restorer and most things have a time element and a budget element as well. So I've got to weigh up the options whether it's quicker for me to make a mold and um, the expense that this entails or whether it's quicker to actually spend a little bit of time and then actually create those missing sections out of clay. Um, it's a bit of a different mindset working 3D. Sometimes it takes me a while to kind of get in my head what I'm actually creating, but it's usually just referencing what's already there on other corners and then um, just creating something to match. Unfortunately, this frame had lost every one of its corner um, embellishments, these bands that go over the joins. So here I'm just kind of creating one with, um, with, the, with the clay again. Um, I've seen many of these over my time, so it's just a matter of forming the, the shape over that join. Um, it might take a bit of a floral pattern. I'll look elsewhere on the frame to um, put something in there in keeping with the frame. So here's me just doing a little bit of that. Once I'm happy with the um, elements that I've added uh, and it's fully dried, I'll add a couple of coats of shellac varnish over the top. Uh, this will soak in, it'll harden the clay further. I'll do a couple of coats of this and then um, it will also seal the clay for when I'm ready to start colouring it to match the patina of the frame. Once that shellac has dried, I'll then apply a base coat of oil pigment over the top. I usually take a, a measure of um, the colour, the base colour that I can see underneath the gold and use that as an undercoat. Just covering over all the um, added elements then just to blend that in. And then once that's dry, I'll look at matching the um, gold pigments over the top with um, bronze powders and gold powder.
and also with those compo pieces that I've attached just apply the same base coat under coat just to cover that whiteness put it in the background and then I can get ready to dry brush over the top with the bronzing powders So here I'm just dry brushing over the top now with bronze powder. Um, these are bronze pigments, different shades of gold in there, uh, mixed with a painting medium. And then I'm just lightly brushing that over the top to leave the um, undercoat there and just matching the patina of that frame. So sometimes I'll get it right first time, other times I'll be just mixing those different bronze powders to, to match the, the antique gold finish of this frame. Again, this, this project is on a budget. We weren't going to go and use gold leaf on this project. It was just a matter of tidying up the frame and replacing those missing elements. Um, so that's why we and the client have decided that we will just go with bronze powders on this one. And the, and, the, and the effect is great. If you look here, just dry brushing this over the top just really lifts that frame, replaces what is missing from the surface and just brightens it up and... Um, yeah, not as good as new, but um, matches that patina. Uh, and yeah, it's a, it's a really efficient way of uh, lifting the frame. So there's hardly any pigment on that brush. It's just little elements of, um, of the mixture uh, I've rubbed most of it off so that when I actually do just dry brush over the top it's only resting on the top surface of that frame um, not going in the crevices so I've got that contrast between the, the dark areas underneath and it's just a real light covering of the um, of the gilded powders on the top And then just repeats the process mainly on that top rail um, as previously seen the bottom edges and the top rail are the ones that hold the most dirt so again just a real light covering of the bronze powders just to lift the frame um, and add a little bit of luster back to the top surface When I approach a frame that I've cleaned, it's always a, a matter of balance. It's um, keeping the frame showing its age, looking like it's old, and not just covering up everything completely. So it's a real light touch and just get the balance right with each um, pass of the, of, the, of the bronze powders. And then here's that bowl section on the bottom here. So I cleaned that up, but it's still kind of a bit bashed and knocked and stuff. So here I am just adding a mixture of bowl clay and gesso just to that edge. It's in an ochre finish um, and then once this dries it will be like a solid colour and then this is in keeping with how this frame would have been finished originally. So again it's water based, I'm just going to apply a couple of coats of this all on that bottom rail of the frame, uh, tidying up as I go. So here it is still wet, but once that dries, it will um, it'll have like a matte solid finish. Um, I'll probably just tidy a few sections up where it's a little bit thick there, you can see. Um, but this will give a real nice uh, solid ochre finish to that edge rail. And now we're putting things back together. Here's the slip going back in. Um, I'm using some offsets and screws. Originally it was nailed in. Um, I don't like using nails. I like everything to be uh, fully reversible and these screws will uh, fasten the uh, slip in nicely without putting undue pressure on any element of the frame. Uh, the slip's just been taped up as well just to tidy that up and I'm just putting the hanging brackets in at the back here as well.
once the slip's secured in goes the painting so just resting that back in and once that's in position it's a good fit to the slip it's not uh, hanging over one edge or the other edge too much I'll just square that up a little bit and then again I'll use offsets just to fasten that in um, again just to make sure that the frame the painting's nice and secure and there's nothing damaging not using any nails or any unsightly fixings these will just hold that painting in place nice and secure And then added my label to the back. Um, if anyone wanted to get in touch and find out about the restoration or ask any questions, that'll stay on there. But a little bit of provenance as well. It'll sit there for 100 years and turn nice and brown and old. So here's the painting as it first arrived. You can see all that nicotine on there. Halfway through the clean. What a difference. I always forget how dirty these paintings arrive. Um, and then you can see full clean and varnish. And the difference is it's amazing. It really is. Those cows have come through nice and bright. That figures so strong with his jacket. And again, framed as the painting arrived with the slip dropped down, those cracks in the mitre joints and the end rails with all the gilding rubbed off. And then straightened up, ornamentation replaced, and then um, bronze powders to brighten that frame up. Right, guys, I hope you enjoyed watching that uh, restoration. Um, so. For all intents and purposes, the D-Crook is finished now. It's fitted back up into its frame and will be returning back to its owner. Um, it was a good one. I liked it. I thought it was a nice painting. It cleaned up really well. Um, great big frame on there. If you wanted a constable back in the day and you couldn't afford one, I'm sure a D-Crook would have served you, uh, served you nicely. Um, so that's out to the studio now. I will be starting a new project soon. I've got a new little painting coming in, which is beautiful. And if you've been following me on Instagram, you may well have seen some elements of that. And then, um, yeah, uh, last episode of Harriet coming up soon too. I've been buying some things for her and I will be getting her fitted up and uh, ready to go. So hopefully the next episode that will drop after this will be Harriet. And you can see where we've been up to to that. But um, as ever, thanks for watching. Please hit like, please hit subscribe, leave me a comment, let me know what you think. And uh, thanks for being along, guys, and see you soon. Up here, and another little treat for Harriet. So she's being spoiled today. So this is going on as well. I'll show you what that is in a second.